So two big battles in Joshua, mm -hmm. uh, the Battle of Jericho, which we've been talking about a little bit, uh, and where Israel triumphs, and then the Battle of Ai, where Israel fails. Mm. Can you that's a can you talk about that contrast? Sure. The Battle of Jericho is very clearly God's battle. This is where God is leading Israel uh, in the battle. And so what is interesting in the Bible is you'll often see that when there is something that is the first of its kind or its series, the, the message is powerfully illustrated with God being at the center of it. And uh, so this is the first city that they take. And so it is going to be powerfully illustrated that God is at the center of this battle. Now, how is that made clear? Well, it all begins actually in Joshua chapter 5, when Joshua is um, on the eve of the battle. Uh, now, before we get to chapter 5, let's just quickly recap what's going on here. Uh, Joshua sends out reconnaissance uh, to... to uh, he sends out the spies to go and uh, uh, to bring back information on um, on Jericho. They go. They're very bad spies. They get discovered right away. They're hidden by Rahab, and they, uh, and she she um, helps them. And they come back, and they give Joshua all of the intelligence. And Joshua gets all the people ready, and everything is ready to go. They cross over into the land, and the whole bit. It's led by Joshua. But then in Joshua chapter five. Uh, Joshua goes out for an evening stroll. And on that stroll, he meets a, meets a very strange character. It's, um, he looks like a military figure. He's carrying a huge sword. And Joshua immediately takes him to be some sort of a general. And he asks him a very interesting question. He said, are you, tell me, are you on our side or on the side of our enemies? And um, he answers this question. I think the, uh, the scripture is describing us, the captain of the Lord's army, answers in a very enigmatic way. He says, neither, but I am the captain of the Lord's army. In other words, that's a rebuke to Joshua. Mm -hmm. It's to say to Joshua, Joshua, you asked the wrong question. The question is not whose side I'm on. The question is whose side you're on. It is my battle. And it's up to you to get on line with me. It's not me that's going to support your battle. And so it's powerfully made clear, perhaps just before the battle takes place, so that Joshua is very clear that this is the Lord's battle. And he needs to get on side. He is being used as God's instrument. And it is not his initiative. So that's one thing. The second thing, the way the, whole, the way the Lord arranges the whole thing is very interesting. So he tells them, this is the way you're going to approach uh, Jericho. You're going to get the priests at the front. And uh, you're going to get, I think you're going to get some army, a little bit of army at the front. Sorry, and the priests are going to be in the middle. And they're going to be carrying the ark. And then you're going to get the, the rear guard. You're going to get a vanguard. You're going to get the priests in the middle carrying the ark. And you're going to get the rear guard. And you are going to march around it every day for seven days. And on the seventh day, you're going to march it around it seven times. And then you're going to shout and, and blow your trumpets and the walls are going to come tumbling down. That whole arrangement is div divine because the, uh, the, placement of the, the placement of the ark, which represents God and his presence, right at the center between the, between the, uh, the, 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 the vanguard and the rear guard, is exactly where the king would normally occupy if he were leading the battle. So if the Jerichoites on top of their, up on top of their wall looking down and they see this army coming around, they will, they, the first question they're going to, ask is, going, to, going to ask is who is leading this? And the first place they're going to look to find who's leading it is the center of the army. And here, instead of a human being, they're going to, f they're going to see the strange, the strange object, the ark. And then they would get the message, hopefully, because they understood what the ark was. If they understood what the ark was, that it is God leading this battle. And the number seven is a holy number. It represents divinity and, uh, and, and deity. And so seven days, they march around it seven times. And then on the seventh day, seven times, clearly to get it very clear that this is the Lord's battle, that he is leading it, he is front and center, this is not their thing. And then very crucially, to the victor belongs the spoils. And so because God is leading this battle, everything in the city is to belong to the Lord. 
And the way in that culture you showed something belonging to the Lord is you, you offered it up as a burnt offering, a whole burnt offering, a, a holocaust. And so the whole city is to be put uh, into a, uh, offered as a great holocaust to God. Uh, 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 Jericho is the first city, and so therefore the first fruits of uh, the cities that the Canaanites, uh, that the Israelites will take, and it is God who is leading it, therefore he, to him belong the spoils, and in all of those ways Joshua is being shown that this, is all, this all belongs to God, and it is by God's help that you're doing it. And so there is no human strategy really involved, and that's how they take the city. But something goes wrong in the plan. And that is one man from the tribe of Judah, of all places, the leading tribe, steals from God. To the victor belongs the spoils. So all those spoils belong to God. And he took some desirable gold or whatever objects and he hid it under his tent. And that was a extremely, uh, it was a traitorous thing to do. It was treasonous because you were stealing from the general. And if a soldier steals from the general, his property, that's a treasonous act. And it was a blasphemous act, and it was a sinful act. It was a high-handed act. He did it knowingly. So the great victory over here, now comes the second city. And the second city, compared to Jericho, is a tiny little thing. And Joshua says, that's a little city. Uh, we don't even have to send the whole army. We'll just send a, a small force. This is Go AI. and take it. This is AI, um, up on the northern spine of Israel. Uh, what chapter is this in? Uh, AI is in chapter 8, okay. I believe. Okay. And so they go and they get whipped. They get royally whipped by them. And Joshua and the army are left in tatters, going, what went wrong? Why did this happen? Now, there are many reasons people give as to what went wrong. They'll say, well, he was overconfident. He sent a small army. Uh, he didn't pray before the battle. But... The narrator gives you, the narrator, once again, the narrator gives you the right uh, perspective. He tells you uh, there was sin in the land, that Achan took the stuff and hid. And God is not going to give you victory when you have committed sin. And so Joshua goes and, and cries before the Lord, and the Lord tells him, uh, basically, why are you crying to me? There is sin in the camp, and that is why you have lost. And so the Lord then gives Joshua a plan to flush out the sinner. And it's a long involved plan. He says, next day, call all the tribes together, tell them what has happened, and then cast lots for uh, everybody, and, and I'll show you the sinner by the lot. So Joshua assembles everybody and tells them, tomorrow, this is what we're going to do. Now go. Well, nobody comes forward, and so the next day they do the process, and you know the story, Achan is taken by the lot. And Joshua says to him, why did you do this, my son? He said, well, I saw this, I desired it, and I took it. Too bad. And then he repents. But it's too late. He and his household are brought out, and they are executed and killed. Now, people look at that and say, wasn't that really harsh? I mean, Achan repented and so on and so forth. Well, think about it. Joshua announced this process the night before. Achan had the whole evening and night to put it right. He could have come to Joshua at any point in there and said, okay, look, I'm sorry, I'm the one. Okay, and I did this and it was wrong. He waited and, and he watched all the tribes go through, still didn't say a word. Then finally his tribe, jo uh, Judah, then all the clans and then all the families of the clan and never raised his voice. Why? Because he was so arrogant and proud, he didn't think it was going to work. He didn't think he would ever be found out. That is high-handed sin. And so uh, he deserved everything he got because... But this actually shows us another very interesting point, and that is how, who really makes up the people of God? Because here uh, in the story, in, the, in these early chapters of Joshua, you have a total Canaanite who shows faith and then is incorporated into the people of God. And here you have a Hebrew of Hebrews, an Israelite of Israel from the leading tribe, and because of sin, is cast out. Mm. So it shows you that the people of God are made up not just by lineal genetic descent, biological descent of Abraham. Mm. You have to have the faith of Abraham. That the people of God uh, are required uh, also to show faith. Mm. And anybody who showed that faith was included in. Mm -hmm. Whereas somebody who was already in and assumed to be in, when they, sh when they showed th that lack of faith, they are cast out. 
And Paul will make that exact same point. Oh yes, powerfully so, yeah. powerfully so. Yeah. yeah, so that's the story of Jericho and AI, very important, instructive mm -hmm. to us. I should say this much uh, as a practical point. I think these are types, this is typology. Of course, Joshua's name in Hebrew is Yehoshua, which is the same name of Jesus in Hebrew. If you take Jesus' name in Hebrew, it's Yehoshua, he is Joshua. And uh, what Joshua shows us is, remember we said he went and fought the main battles and then it was up to the people to go and fight the smaller battles as a, and, 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 and implement the victory that Joshua won. I see a similar pattern in our own lives today. Christ has fought the big battle. He has defeated Satan on the cross. Yeah. Satan, sin and death are defeated. Yeah. Now he calls us through the spirit to go and fight the mini battles yeah. in our lives. But unfortunately, sometimes that is where we fail <laughs> and we do not carry the process out the way it should have, the way we should because we lack faith in him or we try to, or we just, are, we just don't engage in the battle. Mm -hmm. But it is there. And these cities, these entrenched Canaanite cities represent, I think, uh, they could rep represent metaphorically, metaphorically sin in our lives. You know, they could be very entrenched sin, uh, maybe an addiction to porn or gambling or lying or something like that, that we have to go and extirpate. Mm -hmm. uh, and the only way we'll do it is through the help of our Joshua, mm -hmm. who will go in and help us take those territories that are inside and that we are protecting. Mm -hmm. But then there are outward cities as well, especially in our day today where, where there's such a powerful secular leftist ideology that, that is coming against uh, the faith right now. Uh, we are called in this pattern to go and take those places and fight with the sword of Joshua, which is no longer a physical sword, now it is the sword of truth and justice and righteousness, and take these cities for the kingdom of God.